The Apple versus FBI case has been dropped, Verizon was hit with a hack, bad luck is a coming, and more USB hacks. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Hello world, I'm Shannon Morse and this is ThreatWire for March 30th, 2016, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Patrons, be on the lookout. New security episode by Darren Kitchen is happening this week on the Patron feed, and if you want early access to extras, behind the scenes, and more, check out our Patreon page. It's over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and thank you to everybody who is supporting us. On to the news. Yes, it is official, at least the FBI is saying so. They have found a way into the iPhone used by the San Bernardino terrorism suspect, as reported on Monday. They are now asking the judge ruling over the case case against Apple to vacate the order. So basically, they're dumping the court battle. U.S. Attorney Eileen Decker said in a statement, our decision to conclude the litigation was based solely on the fact that, with the recent assistance of a third party, we are now able to unlock the iPhone without compromising any information on the phone. The third party company is rumored to be Celebrite, an Israeli company that specializes in phone data extraction, but this hasn't been confirmed. So my biggest question is, how did the U.S. government get into the iPhone? And are Apple's phones really as secure as they've purported to be? And what happens now with the several other phones across the U.S. that the government is trying to break into against Apple's wishes? I highly doubt that Apple's going to receive any help from the U.S. government to find this flaw in their iPhones and fix it, specifically if it'll make the Fed's job harder to do, which obviously it will. Now, while there are a lot of theories going on around right now, there's a lot of rumors, there aren't a lot of verified facts related to the specifics of this news how they got in and who helped them and if there was any useful information actually on the phone or was it all just a waste of time? And given the Snowden-like effect that this story is going to have on the general public and which I've already been seeing with like my own grandmother, I'm really hoping that it introduces more concepts about security to a larger consumer market. Verizon offers cell phones and TV service but also telecommunications for enterprises. And they were just hit with a hack stealing 1.5 million customers' basic information off of Verizon's Enterprise Portal website. Yeah, the security hole has already been fixed, but the data has made its way to the deep web, where the 1.5 million records are being sold for $100,000, or limited rates for limited amounts of data. Currently, little is known about the breach, but customers affected are being contacted. So this begs the question, how much is your data worth? According to this, about $15. Now, is it wise or unwise to publicly disclose that a vulnerability is present in a popular piece of server software? That and the free advertising for a company that comes along with discovering a new vulnerability is currently under scrutiny by many in the InfoSec community. Badlock is a new vulnerability that was found by Cernet, a German company, and their Samba team member, Stefan Metzmacher. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name. The problem is in code written for Samba software, which is used to integrate Linux or Unix servers with Windows boxes. Now, not much will be known until Patch Tuesday, which is on April 12th, when a fix will be administered for the bug, but the hype and the free press for CERNET also comes with a cost. With how many days are going to happen until the patch is actually released on April 12th, Black Hats will have plenty of time to also find the vulnerability and use it in the wild. Not to mention, the guy that found the problem also worked on the same software for many years <laughs> writing code. So what if the problem actually persists in his code, not somebody else's? Don't know. Now, for current admins using Samba as part of their network, you'll just have to sit and wait, which is very unfortunate, and hope that the vulnerability doesn't go wild before April 12th. USB drives, those things that you get at conventions all the time, the one thing that you really shouldn't plug into your computer when you find one in the parking lot, talking to you, Mr. Robot. <laughs> for years, USB drives have been known to be a perfect breeding ground for malware, and a new Trojan called USB Thief has been found in the wild. USB Thief leaves no trace on the victim computer and can only be run on the original 
traditional USB flash drive it was installed on. It pretends to be a part of a portable application. I mean, lots of programs these days, such as Firefox, Notepad++, uh, Chrome, a lot of them run as portable programs just on a USB flash drive, and they just allow you to boot them up from the drive instead of installing on the PC. It works really well, and it's quite quick for smaller machines. Now, when run, USB Thief runs in the background. With a mix of AES-128 encrypted files and SHA-512 hashes, it protects itself from being copied to another drive because it depends on the drive itself. ESET ESET Ireland was able to reverse engineer some of it, so they released information publicly on this malware. USB Thief is most likely targeting towards air-gapped computers or machines that have no connection to the internet, hence air-gapped. So our best warning would be don't plug random drives in, and if you do, don't run portable apps unless you created them yourself from a reliable source. Now, early access to show summaries, behind the scenes pictures, Darren security videos, it's all available for patrons over at patreon.com slash threatwire. Plus, plus, and this is a big plus, when we hit our next goal, which we're really, really close, we're gonna be able to afford a top-notch RSS feed. And I'm so looking forward to that because I know there's tons of you out there that want to download the show in an RSS reader or a podcasting app. Now, if you are already a patron, Thank you so much, because our show is independent and it's always going to be ad-free because of your help. And if you are a Hush Puppy contributor at that perk level, you can send us pictures of your furry friends. Even if they are no longer with you, we really, really appreciate those pictures and we love seeing the pals that you grew up with. We love seeing your pet pals, so thank you for sending them in. And you can find all of our episodes, links to our social networks, and other ways to contribute over at threatwire.net. And with that, I am Shannon Morris. I will see you on the internet.